My next guest is uh, here for her first visit on this show. She is uh, probably one of the most intense, uh, outspoken, perhaps one of the most intellectual voices in America today. Uh, her books, The Fountainhead, which was made into a motion picture, and Atlas Shrugged, have sold millions of copies. And uh, some people say that her objectivism, objectivist newsletter is one of the more vital publications in the world today. This is her new book called Capitalism, The Unknown Ideal. I think you will find her most unusual and most controversial. Would you welcome, please, Miss Ayn Rand. It's, uh, it's indeed a pleasure to have you with us tonight. I'm delighted to be here. I know that you probably don't appear on many shows of this nature. It's kind of a, a crazy entertainment show generally, although we do like to sit down occasionally and, uh, and get some views of people that are important in the world today. Well, I don't uh, disapprove of entertainment. In fact, I've been watching you many times. I'm very, very happy. Um, we'll talk about this uh, later on. I, I know it's very difficult to state any philosophical principles like objectivism in a, in a short period of time or to condense it but Quite. can you give us some basic idea of objectivism and the, the principles of philosophy that you believe in all right now i'll make it very brief with the understanding that anyone who really is interested would look it up in my books particularly in atlas shrugged because otherwise i can't give a long discourse and proof here so just as mentioning the highlights the basic principle of objectivism is that man must be guided exclusively by reason. Reason is the faculty that identifies and integrates the material provided by his senses. That's a formal definition. That reason is man's only tool of knowledge, his only guide to action, and his only guide to the choice of values. As a consequence of that, man's proper ethics or morality is a morality of rational self-interest which means that every man has a right to exist for his own sake and he must not sacrifice himself to others or sacrifice others to himself that the achievement of his own rational happiness is the highest moral purpose of his life as a consequence of that the only system the only political system which expresses this morality is the system of laissez-faire capitalism, by which I mean full, unregulated, uncontrolled capitalism, a system based on the recognition of individual rights, including property rights, in which all properties owned by private individuals. Uh, the principle which ties morality to politics is the principle that no man has the right to initiate physical force, violence, compulsion against other men. Men have certainly the right of self-defense, but no man, no group of men, that includes the government, has the right to initiate force and to force a man to act against his own judgment. Now this is the essence of the philosophy, but if you want me to illustrate what it means, it means that very beautiful song which we just heard, which was sung magnificently, only in reverse. It means that man, if he chooses his ideals rationally, can and must achieve them. Here on earth, in reality, that there are no unreachable heights for men, there are no unwritable goals, uh, wrongs. Uh, in other words, I approve enormously of that which makes people like the sun, but I don't approve of its content. I say man can be happy, can achieve the ideal here and on earth. Things with uh, Mr. Ant tonight. Uh, your objectivism is, in a way, of course, why there's so much controversy, is that it is almost contrary to, I guess, the cultural beliefs as people have been brought up, true, as to sacrifice the good of your fellow men and uh, not to have the self-egoism uh, and self-sacrifice, as you call it. Not almost contrary, the exact opposite. And you're saying that man should first serve his own self-interest and be interested in himself first. I wouldn't say first. I would say only. But you would have to explain this. Other men 
can be of interest to an individual if they represent values, moral values. You serve your own interest best by finding, associating with, working with the right kind of people. Therefore, other people can be a value, a great value to a man, but only when and if they correspond to his moral ideas, not otherwise. In other words, man does not have to serve anyone except himself, but he does, in effect, serve others when their interests and their values agree. Now, you say, you said, um, serve yourself. I think you said that the, you, know, you, you discuss values quite, quite frequently and why men need values and how they get their values. Because you say man comes into the world without any preset notion of values or concepts and learns. Why is it that we were discussing youngsters this afternoon that you find very young children who are by nature selfish? Young children are completely self-oriented. Now, do they learn that or is that something that is inherent in the, in the very young, that they are completely self-oriented? Uh, well, I think that's inherent in everything that's living. It's inherent in any living entity, an entity which was not concerned with itself, or, put it better, an entity that did not value itself, did not exist for very long. But now, children are below uh, the understanding of the issues, they in effect do not yet have a choice. It is when children begin to speak, when they begin to acquire ideas that their choice begins. And the idea of self-sacrifice is a totally artificial, very evil idea which children and adults learn from others, which is passed from person to person. Now, it doesn't mean that if a child were left alone, he would naturally be selfish properly. No, because it is an enormous achievement to discover rational selfishness, not acting on the whim or pleasure of the moment, but knowing what is rationally an important goal of what value is it you and how to achieve it. The uh, idea of being rationally selfish is not uh, available to children. It would take a long period of thought or the proper teaching for them to discover it. You say man is an end to himself. Uh, you say A is A and existence is existence and That's we are right. here as an end to itself. Why is it that man throughout I guess at least recorded history, needs, seems to need something else, a belief, which you do not believe in, uh, I assume, uh, do not believe in the existence of the Supreme Being or God or Creator or whatever no, I do not. you want to label it. Why has man then seemed to need that ever since man has been on Earth? Uh, I, uh, is, he, is it to, to rationalize his existence here? I uh, wouldn't call it a need. I would say he has resorted to it by default because all the content of man's consciousness he has to acquire. He has to acquire by thought, by knowledge. He has to discover it by default of a proper understanding of life, which means of a proper philosophy of life. Man resort to blind taste. Uh, it is a phenomenon of default. Men have not yet progressed out of it. You don't think it serves a need for many people? Uh, you, you say it's a need, that. but you say it's the wrong because it's a wrong need, it's is that a, it? It's a need that fills a vacuum uh, in the sense that the actual need is for a conscious philosophy of life. Man is a conceptual being. He can't exist range of the moment. He needs a la larger view, a long-range plan. By default of proper rational principles, he falls on religion because that is all that is offered to him. So that I regard religion as the infancy of mankind. It is uh, the pre-philosophical stage, and a great many people are still in their infancy. You have many lectures at, at the colleges. Uh, oh, yeah. What is, do, you, do you find the feeling, that, that type of a feeling, away from uh, religion per se, and more in your, if you say, completely rational reasoning without faith? I've never attempted to take a poll of those issues, but I just wonder what they t asked you and what they discussed with you. Oh, yes. Here's what I find, that young people, particularly in colleges, are enormously anxious to find rational answers. This is not to say that they will all necessarily always be rational, but they need the uh, quest for understanding, for an integrated, consistent view of life is there and enormously and tragically. Uh, if you begin to speak to them about faith, 
or religion or any form of mysticism, most of them will not listen with great interest. When you talk about morality and setting a, a sense of values, um, does each individual set his own standard of morality? Because one person's morality affects those around him, does it not? No. It does not? Uh, oh, it affects it all, right. No, but uh, to say that each person sets his own standard would simply mean subjectivity. <coughs> no, what sets the standards is the science of ethics. That is a branch of philosophy. Its particular task is to define moral standards. Then it is up to each individual to decide what he agrees with, which standards he considers right, if he thinks, which standards he considers rational. Now, an individual may discover a new set of standards, but it is not subjective, it is not just up to him. If he discovers such a subjective code, this is not really morality, this is not ethics. That's just what we call whim worship. Do you think it's uh, immoral, if that's the right word, for somebody who is not productive or to, to not produce the capacity? No, uh, I wouldn't say that. Well, suppose somebody doesn't want to, say, work. Uh, maybe his self-interest is uh, served by, by not producing uh, or working to capacity. Oh, wait a moment. Now, if, uh, if you're asking me, should every man be productive? Yes. And that is to not... To the limits of his ab uh, ability. Yes, but it doesn't mean that he should work himself to death. But he may have other interests in his life, too. But as his primary goal, if you mean should every man's first value, top goal, should it be productive work on any level of ability? I would say yes, certainly. And if a man does not want to be productive, he is immoral. Do you think, you think the word you was an emotional parasite? Uh, if he places other people above his own productive career, his own creative mind, then he's an emotional parasite. Uh, do you emotionally have a, get attached to people, friendships, close friendships? Oh, yes. But you don't place their interests above what you, what you do? There's never any clash, because I would be friendly only with rational people, and among rational people, there's no clash. We'll be right back. <laughs> back with uh, Ian Rand now. Ed, did you say you wish to ask something? I was just wondering, in our culture, uh, it seems that uh, everything springs from fam the family relationship, to the little tiny individual groups of husband, wife, child, or whatever. How does that grouping fit in with your philosophy? In other words, how do you share? Optionally. Oh. And so optionally, I don't think that uh, the family is the necessary uh, unit of society, but I think it's precisely independent individuals that would make the best husbands and wife uh, if they share the same values, the same interests. Uh, they would form the proper kind of unions that would be the lasting unions. But I would never maintain that a fam uh, family is an obligation on the individual. If a man cares to marry, that is fine, or a woman, if not, it's fine also, provided they have rational reasons for their choice. What are the greatest hangers you find that young people have today? I suppose guilt, anxiety, uh, would be... A There's a fly buzzing around here. Maybe it's protesting. <laughs> <laughs> Protest? Uh, you find a lot of uh, anxieties? That's a word that is used very often by psychotherapists today, anxiety, yes, fears, sir. guilt. It's above all confusion, and consequently, and very often unearned guilt. Some of it is earned, all right, if people consciously do what they know to be wrong, but the more tragic thing is unearned guilt. Young people and older ones too, who accept guilt because of the wrong moral standard, who are really not guilty, but are made to feel guilty but to, by today's culture. Who sets the moral standards? They, now they say, uh, people say the churches should set the moral standards, the parents should set the moral standards. Uh, the philosophers. The philosophers set them. Properly. Now you say who should. Uh, historically, yes, the church has set them for much too long and with disastrous consequences. Uh, but uh, if you ask me who should, philosophers. And are they? As Not as they stand today, no. No, as they would be... But ideally. not all philosophers have the same uh, judgments, do they? No. And therefore, what is the arbitrary reason? Well, it has to come down to the individual again. Uh, each individual has to decide what he concludes is right. But then, 
I will determine who is objectively right, the one who can prove his case, the one who can prove uh, the kind of code of morality he advocates without any contradictions. I read an article of yours recently, someone sent it to me, about you were talking about uh, the draft, freedom, uh, and the war, and etc., about that a country should not require or has no right to require of an individual, I may be not, not having the context quite right, um, to no, serve right. in a... You, you said it a while ago, that if a country is attacked, people defend uh, and will, will fight. But you didn't think it was right for a country to demand of its citizens. A conscripted army was not a good idea. No, it is a very immoral idea. It is unconstitutional. Thank you. Can we explore that a wee bit now? We sure got a few boos there, uh, that, which is to be expected. Anytime anybody has any views that don't go according to the norm, you're going to have some uh, antagonism. But that's why we want to talk about these things. Oh, my views will probably be the norm of the future, but not right now. You say conscripted army, or an army by conscription that's drafted, is usually not an effective army. And, and uh... Uh, That military authorities have repeatedly testified that it is not an effective army that a volunteer army, an army of men who know what they're fighting for, speaking in practical terms, is much more effective, much better army. But first, the moral issue underlying it. I say that no single individual has the right to demand the life of another individual. Each man is the owner of his own life. That is the meaning of the idea that a man has the right to life, to his own life, not anybody else's. Well, if no single individual has the right to your life or mine, 10 million of them or 2 billion do not acquire that right by ganging up on one man. No man has the right to demand the life of another, therefore neither has a group, nor a nation, or nor a country. Men do not have the right to the life of another human being. Now, of course, your uh, opponents will say that you're born in a country and in freedom and people are trying to take over the world and if we do not stand fast now and protect our freedoms, uh, we, we may be lost. What is your answer to that? That this is a contradiction because it, what it amounts to is saying since people are trying to take away your freedom, give it up yourself. Uh, that is uh, the sole meaning of this kind of, of argument. You do not descend to your enemy's level uh, in order to defend yourself, morally speaking. Practically speaking, of course, it doesn't work. Well, war, uh, first of all, is terribly stupid. Um, you are not saying, of course, that if this country was not attacked, the people would fight. I would say if it was attacked, yes, people would, because people have always fought for a free or even a semi-free country. Uh, if you ask me, is it proper to uh, fight? When your country is attacked in self-defense, yes, I would say certainly, and men should volunteer to fight in such a case because it is in defense of their own rights and their own freedom. But a country does not have the right to compel them to fight, particularly in a war like Vietnam, in which the United States have no interest whatever. We have nothing to gain by that war, and it is draining this country. Therefore, I am enormously opposed to the whole Vietnam mess, but for the opposite reasons from the one, uh, from those that those Vietniks are yelping about. I do not agree with them, but I am against the war of Viet in Vietnam because it is a useless and senseless war, and it does not serve any national interest. We'll be right back after this brief message. Stay with us. <laughs> I don't know. We've got a couple of flies. Was, I don't know what it is about those. They'll drive you crazy. Um, what would you like to discuss? There, there's so many questions. Obviously, we're talking about the war. Um, it becomes an emotional tug of war with many people, doesn't it? Because you hear the words patriotism, freedom, uh, communist enslavement, and you think sometimes people get emotionally involved in it rather than rationally exploring it? Today, yes. But that is the whole trend of today's culture, is that people act uh, on the direction of their emotions. What is your answer to the thing. people who say if we do not stay fast in Vietnam and we leave, that all of Asia will follow and eventually we will be fighting the war um, in the United States? I would say Asia is not the place to start opposing communism. I would say we have given up so much in Europe 
where if you want to defend civilization, I say if, that's the place to begin. But strictly speaking, if we wanted to save the world from communism, it's not necessary to go to war. All what we have to do is stop helping them economically, stop building bridges to them, which have supported them for 50 years now. That country would collapse of its own evil if the semi-free world did not constantly help them. Now, you were born in Russia. Yes. You were born in, now Leningrad, St. Petersburg, uh, okay. then at the time. Uh, obviously, you were tremendously opposed to communism, and it's what not it stands for. Not for that reason. But not for that reason. No. Because of the evil of... Uh, of the idea of communism. I've never been particularly patriotic about Russia, because I was very young at the time of the revolution. I was 12. But the whole Russian culture, I am opposed to it. It is a mystical culture. Uh, all that I like about Russia is some of her writers and some of her music, but that's about all. Uh, I uh, am much more American in fundamental principles than I'm Russian. Do you think it is possible to live? Uh, now, we, uh, we have existed fairly well with Yugoslavia and some of the other countries who are communistic without too much problem. Do you think it's possible in the long run to coexist with a, a communist China? This seems to be the big fight of the Western world is con the containment of, uh, of communist China. Uh, a free country can coexist with anyone and incidentally free the rest of the world by example if it is free itself and if it has a firm domestic and foreign policy. Remember that the United States destroyed tyranny, serfdom and slavery all over the world, not by fighting wars, by example, by free trade. Uh, a free country destroys barriers gradually but for that you need a proper political philosophy we had the beginnings of it in the 19th century not the full case and we lost the case why did we lose because capitalism cannot coexist with the morality of altruism uh, if and when we return to a proper political system it wouldn't be a return and going back it's going forward because it has never yet fully existed but it would have to be on the basis of an appropriate morality, a rational morality of self-interest. And in that case, you would not have to fight wars. But I'll, uh, I'll call this to your attention. The 19th century was the most peaceful period in history. The only period without a major world war between the end of the Napoleonic Wars and World War I. And that was the closest to capitalism that the civilized world had come. Uh, contrary to all the popular nonsense, capitalism does not lead to wars. That is the peaceful system, and that has been demonstrated uh, in historical practice. But today, was the kind of mixed economy and mixed philosophies that we stand for, we will ultimately probably have to fight, unfortunately. If we had better ideas, a country like Russia or Yugoslavia for the whole damn world would not be any problem or any threat to the United States. Do you think that day is going to, uh, to come? We don't seem to be getting too much smarter. Nobody uh, in, can in predict our... the immediate future. I don't know. Men have free will. It is possible. I don't see any large-scale sign of it yet. But on the other hand, America is the one country which could not collapse to statism. It's contrary to this whole past and all these basic premises, whereas, whereas Europe always was statist. I don't believe that America could go statist, though what kind of trouble we would get into on the way to liberation, I don't know. Thank you. We're going to take station identification. We'll be right back. We've been talking the past half hour with Ian Rand and uh, Buster Crabb, who was scheduled to be on tonight, will be with us next week. Um, we got talking here, and uh, I think everybody wanted to hear what you had to say. Now, a lot of people probably do not agree with a lot of your views, and uh, when Miss Rand agreed to appear on the show, she only asked one thing. She says, he, he won't attack me. And I said, no, I wouldn't do that, because I don't think it's a good idea to invite a guest on the show and then take issue with their views or to bring somebody else on with opposing views and have them sit and yell at each other for half an hour. I'd much rather have you here and express your philosophy and uh, other times we've had other people on the show.
who may have opposing views, but I think it makes for a much easier show, and people get more information from it that way. Oh, of course. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, this is your, this is your magazine called The uh, Objectivist, which does uh, explain, and we only briefly touched into your philosophy tonight. If anyone wants full proof or greater discussion, this is where they will find it in the magazine of which I am co-editor with Nathaniel Brandon, The Objectivist. Why is it to people, we talked about, uh, you said you, you are an atheist, and uh, why does that word bring up such violent reaction from people? I think mainly by surprise. You say, I'm an atheist and I don't believe in a creator, and they're not quite willing to... Uh... I don't, I've never found many people who did believe in God, but the idea of declaring yourself to be an atheist frightens them. The way that's going on record, huh? That's my impression of people. That always reminds Although I must say, I'm... I don't have, uh, I don't associate with religious people. Not too much. Really? Well, not intimately, therefore I would not know what... Uh, don't you find, do you find some religious are. people who are, are, are intellectual? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. It's, it's, it's perfectly compatible to be intellectual and still believe in the uh, uh, Supreme Being, isn't it? Perfectly compatible, no. It's not perfectly compatible. All right, then. Ryan, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you. We'll see you on Monday. This program was pre-recorded.